Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. The world-renowned, legendary constitutional lawyer, Lawrence Tribe is with us. Larry Tribe has left an indelible impression on generations of Harvard Law School students. A staunch advocate of civil rights, he has argued dozens of cases before the United States Supreme Court. Recently, he has focused on the standards of presidential accountability arising out of the acts of Donald Trump on January 6th. We are delighted and very much honored to have Larry Tribe with us on the program. Well, Larry, marvelous that you're here. And um, of course, uh, you have uh, attacked so many exquisite constitutional issues in the course of your career, but uh, none more interesting, I would think, than the last four years, which is the presidential accountability uh, during the administration of Donald Trump. I mean, I've followed your Twitter feed and uh, it kind of uh, presents a, a series of landmarks and milestones as to each time Trump has violated the constitution. But now we have the events of January 6th. So uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, it's certainly uh, been an education because there are lots of aspects of the constitution that had faded into the background and were not really central when we had normal presidents who didn't test the limits quite as much. But I have to say, I've had uh, 50 years of intriguing constitutional issues about reproductive rights and about uh, federalism. And, and the last four years have been more nerve wracking than others, but not necessarily more interesting, just, just pushing the country closer to the edge of, of constitutional failure than anything I've ever anticipated experiencing. Well, uh, I mean, for example, uh, gay rights, where you've been such a staunch advocate and uh, you, uh, uh, in 1978, in your book, uh, you talked about discrimination uh, against gays as being tantamount to racial or religious discrimination, uh, discrimination right. based on sex. Uh, but. I mean, did you ever suppose you'd be dealing with issues like, can the president pardon himself? I didn't suppose that. But when I was writing in 1978 about the rights of LGBTQ individuals, most of my colleagues looked askance and wondered, what the hell was I talking about? Why did I think this was important? Um, and I'm not sure why I thought it was important, because, you know, as somewhat privileged, though not rich, a straight white male it, that kind of discrimination didn't hit me personally, but I knew a lot of people who, whose lives were undermined by that kind of discrimination. So that's been very high on my agenda ever since the, the late 1970s. And I well, certainly never thought we'd be talking about things like a president pardoning himself or firing a special prosecutor or uh, propagating the big lie that the election had been stolen from him and then proceeding to launch an insurrection in order to act on that lie. I mean, those things I, I assumed would be limited to banana republics. Well, uh, banana republic is a very interesting uh, uh, question in, uh, in the whole picture because uh, there is certainly reason to believe that uh, Trump violated uh, at least two federal criminal statutes and maybe other local statutes right. uh, and the conspiracy statute. Uh, and yet people say, well, we shouldn't prosecute them. We've got to move on. Uh, we can't be a banana republic where every time someone loses an election, we throw them in jail. Uh, so what's your answer to that? Well, I guess my answer is that if we don't want to be a banana republic, we better preserve our ability to have the one key thing that distinguishes us from, uh, from that, kind of, of that kind of failed state. Uh, and that is something that prevents people from becoming dictators and, and autocrats. If, if a sitting president can gradually condition tens of millions of people into believing that there's no way he can legitimately lose office and that any votes against him are going to be fraudulent, uh, and if having failed to persuade courts of that, such a president can basically stop the transition of power to his successor or her successor, um, at that point, we've really lost everything. So to say that we better just turn the page 
sort of begs the question, what's on the other side of the page? It could be just a, a flaming mess. Uh, that said, I do think we have to be careful, and I think we have to anticipate that Merrick Garland, as the new attorney general, will follow the evidence where it leads, will not just leap to the conclusion that uh, Donald Trump was guilty of conspiracy to commit insurrection, uh, guilty of any number of federal crimes, but whatever the U.S. Justice Department does, there is just no question that Cyrus Vance pursuing financial crimes from the Manhattan courthouse and the district attorney of Fulton County pursuing crimes involving attempting to overthrow the Georgia election uh, in, in Georgia, that those things are going to go forward. So one way or another, uh, this president is going to be in the dock. And then there are all the civil suits, which are simply inescapable uh, suits seeking redress for some of the terrible damage that Donald Trump seems to have done uh, in the course of trying to launch an insurrection. Now, well, let's look at the uh, federal criminal statutes. Uh, you have uh, the rebellion or insurrection statute, and um, you have uh, the uh, uh, seditious conspiracy statute of the leaders, uh, sections 2383 and 4 of uh, Title 18. One of them carries the penalty that he should be disqualified from holding office. Uh, which is what uh, would have happened had, uh, in the second impeachment had the Senate convicted. Uh, do you think he should? This actually, this would go further. They had the Senate convicted and disqualified him. It would only be under the Constitution disqualification from holding any future federal office. The statute that you're talking about, which goes back to a law that has its roots in 1790, that statute says that anyone convicted of insurrection or rebellion shall be imprisoned for up to 10 years and shall never again hold any public office, state, local, or federal. Now, that may not make a big difference because it's a little hard to imagine Donald Trump running for dog catcher, but it is nonetheless a sweeping disqualification, even more sweeping than uh, anything in Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which also applies to those who take an oath to uphold the Constitution and then are guilty of insurrection or rebellion, but only disqualifies them from future federal office. Well, uh, isn't the 14th Amendment kind of a non-starter? Uh, because uh, you'd, you'd have to have enabling legislation. Uh, the Republican senators would say we've been all through this. And, uh, 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 and so uh, why uh, use the 14th Amendment? Well, it's a complicated question. There, there were a lot of people who, at the time of the second impeachment, kept pushing, uh, kept pushing me and, and some of those that I was advising, like Jamie Raskin, uh, to take the 14th Amendment route. I don't think they quite knew what they were talking about. The article of impeachment does mention, as part of the preamble, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which was designed to prevent insurrectionists from holding office. But it is not self-executing. It became clear uh, in opinions, early opinions by Chief Justice Chase, that you would need some kind of implementing legislation that would require a law to be passed under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment to determine just who was guilty of insurrection or rebellion. Um, there still are efforts going on in Congress now by concurrent resolution to simply declare that the consequence of the impeachment by the House and of the bipartisan vote of 57 to 43 to find the president guilty, though that was not enough to remove him. Of course, he couldn't have been removed anymore. He was already out of office, but it wasn't enough to convict him. Nonetheless, it's powerful evidence in a future attempt by the president to officially make himself a candidate. But I do agree with you. It's something of a, something of a distraction, and it would take lots of energy and effort that's probably better spent elsewhere. Now, you mentioned Jamie Raskin. The first impeachment, uh, the chief house manager was Congressman Adam Schiff. And the second, of course, was Jamie Raskin. They're both former students of yours. Both former students, both good friends, both brilliant research assistants, and, uh, and both people with whom I've worked over the years. I, I couldn't be prouder of what some of, some of my former students have done. You know, there's also 
Barack Obama, Elena Kagan. Not all of my former students make me proud. Uh, I have to say that uh, Ted Cruz is not high on my list, but, but I've had a really terrific run and a great opportunity to work with and learn from, but also to some extent influence lots of people who have then, I think, gone on to do really good things for the country. I assume uh, Ted Cruz didn't ask you for advice about his vote on the impeachment the second time around, but I wondered whether uh, uh, did you advise uh, Adam Schiff and uh, Jamie Raskin and the two? I did. I did. I worked closely with with both of them, uh, and there was a time when Ted Cruz asked me for a little advice, though he didn't take it. He called me as one of the main witnesses when he was presiding over a hearing on gun control. I guess because I had said I thought that the Second Amendment provided some limited right to bear arms for individuals and not just the organized militia. And in that sense, I was not in lockstep with all of my liberal friends. He thought maybe he could get me to join him in opposing very reasonable and necessary gun control measures. But I pretty quickly disabused him of that. Uh, did you ever advise him on uh, taking vacations in Cancun in the midst of, <laughs> of, of a blizzard? Well, I, I have to say he never asked. He no, never asked you for that. that. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, do you see uh, legal obstacles apart from the policy considerations in mounting a, a criminal case against Donald Trump? Well, I don't know all the evidence, but it sure looks bad. If if uh, if I were Donald Trump, I would. I would look for a country that has no extradition treaties with the US. He obviously, at one point, he said he was going to urge uh, Governor DeSantis of Florida not to extradite him to New York to face trial before Cyrus Vance if he were indicted by a grand jury. Just one of the many things in the Constitution he seems not to have read. There is no <laughs> real discretion on the part of a governor who is asked to turn over a citizen who has been indicted in another jurisdiction. Well, Vance says he's leaving office at the end of the year. He's not going to stand for re-election. Is it possible he won't do anything? Well, you know, I, I suspect he's, first of all, he's geared up quickly. He's brought on board lots of experts in, in uh, the relevant fields of, of criminal law. The fact that he personally may be gone doesn't mean that his very talented staff will be gone or that all the work will will be gone. I, I suspect that it will all be turned over to someone else who follows the evidence where it leads. I can't imagine it simply being dropped because Cyrus Vance has, has moved on to greener pastures. Uh, well, uh, what would Trump's defense be in a criminal case? I mean, he probably would say he had no criminal intent and uh, what he did was uh, simply uh, political oratory. Uh, so there's a First Amendment question, among other things. Well, first of all, there are a lot of different criminal cases involved. That wouldn't be a defense to the financial crimes that are the ones that Vance is focusing on. It's also not a defense to uh, most of the crimes of which he would be prosecuted in connection with the 6th of, of, of January, because among other things, trying to extort uh, by threatening adverse criminal action against the Secretary of State uh, Raffensperger of Georgia, unless magically the Secretary of State would, quote, find, unquote, enough votes to overturn that state's election. That's a serious crime in Georgia. And the fact that he used words over the phone doesn't mean that he has a free speech defense. Likewise, the uh, insurrection and rebellion counts against him under federal law would not be focused solely on his words. They would be evidence, but they would be evidence of a continuing pattern of attempting to overturn uh, and interfere with the official functions of government and essentially overturn the transition of power. Count one and count two of the civil complaint brought by Eric Swalwell also focus entirely on non-speech offenses. They focus on the offense, essentially, of conspiring to interrupt the official functions of officers of the government, in this case, the function of counting the electoral votes, and then seeing the harm being done and knowing that one could stop it, doing nothing to stop it. Those are the core of count one and two of the, of the nine count uh, civil suit brought by Swalwell. 
there are other counts, both in the Swalwell complaint and in the uh, Bernie uh, Benny Thompson complaint, that do focus on incitement to insurrection. They focus on the oratory, as you put it. But it wasn't just oratory of some guy on, on uh, the corner of you know, Fifth Avenue. This was the president of the United States using his considerable power and influence as president to get people to do his bidding. Uh, the First Amendment is there to protect individual citizens against the government, not to protect the government's own megaphone. But even if you treat him as just a citizen, the Supreme Court's decisions about the incitement to violence draw a sharp line between mere speculation and advocacy and incitement to imminent lawless action that foreseeably produces such action. And in this case, within an hour, the president was well aware that the mob was aiming at the Capitol, aiming at the vice president, whom he said, you know, who they were trying to catch and, and, uh, and put on the gallows, aiming at the Speaker of the House. This wasn't just speech. So if you look at the civil suit, uh, there's really nothing of a First Amendment argument, is there? Uh, and um, you have a, a speech which led to uh, lawless action, and you have the failure to and neglect to, uh, to stop it. Uh, when he was in power to do so. I mean, that reads directly, or the, the federal statutes read directly on that and provide for civil remedy. Well, yes and no. I mean, I, I certainly that's where I end up, but it's not quite nothing. The fact is that you have to separate the counts that are brought under these provisions of national law, the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act, 1981, uh, sorry, 1985 and 1986 of 42 U.S. Code. Those deal with the conspiracy to overturn the government and prevent it from operating and failing to undo that once it had gotten going. Those have no First Amendment defense. But the other seven counts, the other seven counts of the nine count uh, complaint invoke District of Columbia law, basically local law passed by the D.C. government under congressional supervision, but it's not standard federal law. And those are the ones that talk about uh, inciting a riot, inducing a riot. Some of those have a possible First Amendment defense, but as I've explained, the First Amendment defense is very weak. I don't think it's going to prevail. But there will be serious litigation about it, no doubt. It's not going to simply evaporate. The First Amendment will not get erased from this controversy just because uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe says that it's, uh, it, you know, that it is without merit. Uh, now, what do you do about the Fitzgerald case, uh, where right. the Supreme Court held that the president is absolutely immune from official conduct? Liability, civil liability for official crime. Right. Absolutely immune from civil liability after he leaves office for those things within the, quote, outer perimeter of his office. Trying to, in the capacity of a candidate for president, undo one's own loss by fomenting and organizing a violent attack on Congress is not within any imaginable part of the job description of president of the United States. Um, and I think it's very clear that there's no parallel between the defense that Nixon could mount and anything that Trump could mount. In Nixon's case, what's in, what was involved basically was a, a clearly executive action within the president's power to reorganize the Air Force in his role as commander in chief um, and in his role as proposing legislation to Congress. But he did it, it to happened. silence a, a whistleblower. Well, the, the allegation was that his hidden motive was that, that he really he was thinking of a whistleblower named Ernie Fitzgerald when he did it. But the court didn't even have to reach that. It basically said when the president is doing his presidential thing, uh, the fact that in the deep recesses of his mind, he may have a bad reason should not expose him to liability. That's where the absolute immunity came in. It basically said that when the president is exercising a classic executive power, you don't peel back the layers of his brain and ask, did he have some sick motive for doing it? Uh, he shouldn't have to worry about that when he's making presidential decisions. That's not this case. It's not that Donald J. Trump, and for example, when Donald Trump used his various powers 
to fire somebody like Mueller. I think people like me said that could be an impeachable offense, could be obstruction of justice. But I wouldn't say that he could be civilly sued by Mueller now for having deprived him of this uh, interesting job because he was exercising his powers, whatever the motive. That would be immune under Nixon v. Fitzgerald, but certainly not what Trump did with respect to Raffensperger in Georgia or what he did with respect to riling up the mob. That was Donald Trump uh, acting outside his presidential capacity, even though making speeches is part of what presidents do. Well, he did that outside his presidential capacity as citizen Trump. Now, uh, isn't that at odds with your First Amendment argument where uh, you say that uh, the First Amendment was designed to protect me against the government curbing my political freedom of speech, uh, but uh, not designed to protect the government? Uh, Donald Trump against uh, um, uh, any uh, uh, criminal prosecution based on what he says. It's a very, very smart observation, Jim. And I do think there is some tension between those two arguments if you look at them purely in the abstract. That is what I've said is he was not simply exercising a citizen's freedom of speech when he was using the presidential seal and the presidential, uh, the, the prestige of the presidency to rile up the mob. And he certainly wasn't acting purely as a private citizen when he was failing to call out the National Guard. But on the other hand, he was not exercising presidential power. If anything, he was abdicating his presidential responsibility. He was guilty of dereliction of duty. But I think you are on to exactly what the best possible line of argument will be uh, for uh, some of Trump's defenders. They will try to show that you can't have it both ways. Either he is acting in a presidential capacity and therefore immune under Nixon v. Fitzgerald, they will say, or he's acting purely as a private citizen and therefore has a First Amendment defense. And I'm happy to engage both halves of, of that alleged dilemma, but I think that's a, a productive line of argument for them. I think it's a losing line of argument, but I'm not going to rehearse all of the best possible answers to it uh, for the benefit of Donald Trump's lawyers, assuming he can find lawyers. But it's not unknown for lawyers to make inconsistent allegations or to plead out things in the alternative. Not unknown, but it's not the cleverest strategy. That is, there's a reason that people don't like lawyers. And one of them is that they try to have it both ways. I, I tend not to do that. I tend to look for ways of giving a coherent um, consistency to every part of any argument I'm making. I really don't like talking out of both sides of my mouth. It doesn't work very well. Just uh, to leave Donald Trump for a moment, um, could you just tell us some of you have a, a, a unique and fascinating background having come to this country at age uh, seven uh, from you were born in Shanghai, which is very unusual for uh, uh, a Jew to be born in Shanghai, uh, particularly a, a, a Russian Jew. Uh, and uh, could you just tell us something about your background and how you got from there to Harvard? Well, I was actually about six when I came here, and I spoke only Russian. Uh, didn't speak much at all for the first couple of years because kids made fun of my of my attempts to use English, and so I thought I would just stay quiet, which is not my characteristic mode. I went to public schools in San Francisco, um, and then I got you know very lucky. I mean, I had the good luck to be born with some brains and and some ambition, and my parents, being good Jews, were very ambitious for me. Um, and so I ended up going to Harvard, which I had never heard of before I was 15. I got to Harvard when I was 16. I did really well in mathematics, but then I switched over to law. Uh, and here I am. Okay, so I have a question for you, Larry Traub. Uh You came to Harvard as a professor in 1968, a tumultuous year in American history. We saw three assassinations. Uh, and you retired last year in 2020, and uh, that was the year of COVID and the year of Donald Trump, and certainly another tumultuous year in, uh, in American history. Um, do you think history is following you around? Maybe I'm following history around. I don't think it's following <laughs> me, but you're right. I mean, those, those are bookend years. Um, I wouldn't say I retired. I don't. I feel anything but retired. I do have emeritus status, and that means I don't have to grade exams or or attend faculty meetings, though I still do sometimes. But 
it has liberated me to spend you know time in other ways working on on issues that i care about but my life hasn't really changed that much certainly the last four years were very different because because we lived under the oppressive regime of a potential uh, tyrant and a demagogue and the last year has been especially difficult you know i know people who've not been able to say goodbye to their loved ones uh, it's just been horrible and i think it's wonderful to have a president who can empathize with that and really begin moving to do something about it last this last year was really something and i'm i, I can't wait till it's over well uh, the country owes you an enormous debt of gratitude for thinking about these issues writing about these issues influencing other opinion makers uh and uh, their reaction to uh, the last four years and particularly to january 6th so uh i express my gratitude to you for uh, coming by and uh, thank you for coming by tune in next week for more conversations i'm jim zyron be well take care and all the best